Welcome to the project How Epidemics End, based at the University of Oxford. My name is Erica Charters, and in these videos, I discuss with experts how they research disease as well as their investigations into how epidemics end. And today I'm here with Paul Kelton, who's professor of history at Stony Brook University in New York. Paul, you hold a chair in American history, but I know that you've trained in ethno history, and ethno history might be something that people aren't so familiar with. Can you explain a little bit about what ethno history is and how it's different from traditional history? Sure, um, and thanks for that question. Um, ethno history is a field that combines the uh, sources and methodologies of history and anthropology. Um, in order to understand history and culture change of peoples who are underrepresented or not represented at all in the traditional archival uh, source material. So the sources of history are those archival sources um, and you know, hard data that we can get our hands on. Um, but archaeology adds sources that are very important to understand that history as well. So the material record in the ground, uh, ethnography, uh, oral history, folklore that anthropologists traditionally have analyzed are used to understand, again, the, the, the history and culture change of, of those people that are underrepresented. Now, those people tend to be the indigenous peoples of the Americas, as ethno-historians have focused on those groups. Um, so yes, I've been trained in ethno-history since graduate school and, and brought that methodology to bear on my research on the impact of diseases on indigenous peoples. So this, of course, is your, your real area of expertise, not only the history of indigenous peoples in North America, but especially the role of disease. And many people might know that smallpox, along with other diseases brought over by the Europeans, really devastated the indigenous populations. Can you tell us a little bit more about disease and especially smallpox in this early period of American history and how it affected relations between Europeans and indigenous groups? Sure, absolutely. So make no mistake about it, um, the diseases that Europeans brought over did have a devastating impact. And Europeans brought over a variety of diseases that weren't in the Americas prior to 1492. Um, and a disease like smallpox and measles uh, and other diseases in which disease, which indigenous peoples did not have experience with, they lacked acquired immunity. So when introduced to those diseases, you did have high rates of infection and high rates of mortality. Smallpox in particular becomes, I think, the most devastating disease and the one we talk about most uh, in, because of the nature of smallpox. Smallpox uh, for anybody in uh, the early modern period was devastating, high rates of mortality. Uh, I think epidemiologists estimate that mortality rates are up to 40% from variola major. Well, smallpox unique nature made it the most devastating disease of colonization because one, it incubates in the human body for a fairly extended time, 10 to 14 days compared to something like influenza, which incubates for a smaller amount of time. And so that longer incubation period allows a person that's infected to travel farther. Moreover, smallpox remains contagious for a fairly lengthy time for an acute infectious disease. So someone that has smallpox may be contagious for up to two, two weeks. And add on that, um, the, the scabs from smallpox can transmit the disease to people that come into close contact with those scabs. And so you have a disease that spreads much more widely than other diseases that's highly lethal. And that's why smallpox becomes so devastating to uh, indigenous peoples. That's a story that maybe many people know, but you've also done this wonderful research in which in some ways you've challenged this kind of what we might call a straightforward narrative, right? So you've said we shouldn't see disease as a, and especially smallpox as a biological inevitability, but we need to think about how there's other factors. So not just disease that was part of this process, this kind of, this process of devastation. So can you explain a little bit about what your research has found and argued? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the grand narrative is diseases came that indigenous peoples didn't have and they it, they spread like wildfire and native peoples uh, had this extreme mortality that allowed Europeans to fairly easily conquer the Americas. However, smallpox is still an acute infectious disease. It doesn't get from point A to point B without 
certain processes involved. Uh, and in the North America context that I've studied, what I've found is that it is um, the slave trade uh, that facilitates the spread of smallpox. Um, you certainly have large numbers of enslaved African Americans or Africans uh, being sent uh, to the Americas uh, that provide ideal uh, circumstances for diseases such as smallpox to make the transatlantic voyage. In the Americas, you also have the English out of Virginia and South Carolina uh, buying indigenous captives from their trading partners uh, and selling those indigenous captives to, to European masters. And that created a network of trade and violence that facilitated the spread of smallpox. And it's not only this, the getting smallpox from point A to point B, it's that once it gets to point B, indigenous populations, uh, they're much more vulnerable because of colonization. A native people that are being uh, sought after as a source of slaves, they're going to enfort themselves in small nucleated uh, villages in which they're cramply uh, uh, packed together, uh, which would facilitate you know, universal spread of a disease. Uh, slave raids, violence, imperial warfare, all of those uh, add to trauma uh, for indigenous peoples that uh, lessen their ability to respond to this disease, add uh, and malnourishment, high pathogen load, and then you get um, this high rates of mortality. So it's not just the spread of disease itself um, or the disease itself. It's this whole package of colonialism. I think that's so, such a useful reminder to help us to remember that disease takes place within a context, right? And we need to think about the economic, political, military context in order to really make sense of the spread and the incidence of disease. But smallpox remains this, this I think, this kind of almost symbolic but very important disease, especially for U.S. indigenous groups. And even though, of course, smallpox, there's vaccination that really develops across the 19th century, it doesn't end for U.S. indigenous groups until much later. This is something that you've written about. So when, when and how does smallpox end? Well, I really appreciated that challenge because before this project, I actually didn't know. Um, I really stopped in 1824 in my research when um, the group that I particularly focused on, Cherokees, uh, underwent fairly extensive vaccination. Um, and that was a kind of a tidy ending for uh, my book, Cherokee Medicine. But I knew in the back of my head that Cherokees had experience with smallpox after that. Um, and so this kind of got me to rethink that. Well, when did smallpox end? Um, and the best that I could tell, what I, what I came up with, is that it ended when it generally ended in the United States, in that in the turn of the 20th century, you have this fairly widespread smallpox epidemic throughout the United States. It's one that Michael Rurick uh, writes about in his book, Pox. He doesn't talk about indigenous peoples, but it's very clear that this was an epidemic in which finally in the United States, you have uh, um, effective public health measures, isolation, quarantine, and vaccination that put smallpox essentially on its path to eradication in the United States. Indigenous peoples were part of that. And so on Indian reservations, you have Bureau of Indian Affairs agents, tribal leaders, tribal police enacting these public health measures. Uh, and by and large, Indigenous peoples cooperated. Um, you know, there are some episodes of resistance because of you know, kind of the long legacy of colonialism uh, and mistrust uh, of, of the United States. But by and large, indigenous peoples um, cooperated, and that cooperation led to, for most indigenous peoples, uh, the turn of the century marks the end. There's some sporadic cases after that of the variola minor uh, a strain of smallpox, uh, but then it fizzles out, and then, of course, it's eradicated in the United States by the 1940s. Uh, and so that's you know, looking at from high, from the hindsight of a historian, that's when it ended, the turn of the 20th century. So then, because I think it's interesting you say, from the hindsight of a historian, that's what we can see probably looking at official documents. Yes. But you've also written about what those groups who were involved in this vaccination, more kind of eradication campaign, I mean, how do they remember the ending of smallpox? What did it mean for them? Was this a kind of celebratory act? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say there's two sides of that. So the first side would be um, the, the United States uh, and its agents enacting these public health measures. And they weren't fully aware that they were part of this historical mi milestone. I mean, when you look back at it, it's very significant. This disease that was so devastating to indigenous peoples is coming to an end. But those enacting the policy were not that aware of that. And in fact, what they were most concerned with was assimilation, you know, forcing indigenous peoples to give up their culture, their identity, and becoming US citizens and uh, you know, essentially erasing their indigenous identity. And vaccination was part of that process. And it wasn't the most important process. The most important process was probably education, forcing indigenous kids into boarding schools. Um, and so that's what they're most concerned about. They don't really write about, uh, yay, we're doing a great thing by eradicating this horrible disease that had plagued indigenous peoples for generations. Uh, they're writing about how, how many kids are going to boarding school, are indigenous peoples um, adopting private property uh, and becoming Christians. Um, so it goes unnoticed uh, by those enacting policies. For indigenous peoples, uh, there is, best I can tell, in their stories, in their folklore, in their oral history, there's virtually no acknowledgement that smallpox came to an end at a certain point. Uh, instead, they tell stories about smallpox's beginning, and that dominates their, their, uh, the way they conceive history. And often the stories are that smallpox comes as part of uh, human malevolence, malevolence of the colonizers. And those stories are told. Uh, again and again, and that dominates the narrative that to the extent that the, the ending that has happened is not recognized in indigenous um, histories they tell about their own people. Um, and I would add that when smallpox ended for indigenous peoples, it ended at a real um, low point for indigenous peoples in that their cultures were being forcefully erased and also they're being plagued by a number of other diseases, in particular tuberculosis is having a devastating impact on indigenous uh, communities. Uh, and so the perception that, you know, this is a you know, major historical milestone is, it's, it, it, does, it, would, it wouldn't make sense to them because they're indigenous peoples. And for that matter, Bureau of Indian Affairs officials are seeing indigenous peoples and not seeing you know, improvements in health. In fact, they're seeing the opposite when smallpox ends. It's a, it's a sobering reminder, again, to think about the context of so the cultural and the social context of disease. So even Absolutely. if we talk about smallpox ending, that we need to think about what's actually going on with, with uh, um, a group's culture as much as the biological experience. So thank you very much, Paul. And thank you all for, for watching this video. Uh, I will encourage you to fill out our feedback form. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll find the form just immediately underneath the video with the text. If you're watching on the project website, the feedback form is just to the right. It only takes a few seconds and it will help to inform research at the University of Oxford. Thank you very much. And thank you, Paul. Thank you.